So I'm here at Health 2023 in Las Vegas and I'm joined by over 10,000 attendees and 350 something speakers and 850 something sponsors, all convening here at the Las Vegas Convention Center. And this event brings together all the different stakeholders, senior executives and decision makers and innovators to help them accelerate business outcomes, stay ahead of emerging trends, connect with industry, advance their career, or all of the above. And I was lucky enough to speak to a lot of different innovators and thought leaders here at the event over three days. And I'm bringing those conversations to you in this podcast episode today. This is part two of a two-part series. So if you missed episode one, go back and check that out on your favorite podcast player or over on YouTube. So right now, here are some more conversations that I had at Health 2023 in Las Vegas. Collaboration starts with the conversation team Health Tech. Well, let's make it happen. Welcome to Talking Health Tech featuring content and community about technology and healthcare. We acknowledge the traditional owners of lands these conversations were recorded and pay respect to elders past and present. I'm Jenna Carl. I'm a clinical psychologist and a researcher, and I work at Big Health as Chief Medical Officer. Excellent. Thanks for stopping by the podcast booth here at Health. Um, tell us a bit about the work you do at Big Health. Yeah, absolutely. So Big Health is a digital therapeutics maker, which is trying to create uh, non-drug options for common mental health conditions like insomnia, anxiety, and depression. And uh, we're in the business of getting people access to those treatments, which are uh, unfortunately hard to access otherwise. Important issue, I think, in a in the current climate of a lot of issues, uh, particularly around those those points around insomnia and other aspects, a first point of call for a lot of people would be medication to drugs. And that's not a sustainable solution. <laughs> and so digital therapeutics, though, for those unfamiliar with what that is, what is a digital therapeutic? Yeah, it's a great question. So a digital therapeutic is specifically software-based medicine, which is are regulated as a medical device in the U.S. and in most other countries around the world, meaning it is under a greater degree of regulation and has higher standards for quality, safety, and efficacy. So it's very much like other classes of traditional medicine, like medications um, or medical devices that you, you'd, you know, you'd require uh, rigorous clinical trials to show safety and efficacy uh, prior to marketing. You'd also require high levels of quality manufacturing practices in software that really is uh, quality systems for the product development, um, as well as like really rigorous cybersecurity protocols. So those are things that are not required in consumer wellness apps, but are required as part of it being a digital therapeutic where you really are delivering a treatment clinical grade level intervention. And so that, that's really um, what's necessary when you're talking about like proper medicine. It's interesting when you think about it on a spectrum of from a consumer's point of view, they've got everywhere from you know, your consumer apps that have cool filters that make you look like dogs and stuff. And then right up to, you know, your comprehensive medical devices that are, that have an interface on them and perhaps something that you might use, but it, it feels like a clinical grade bit of kit. And you've got digital therapeutics, which you download on your consumer phone, but they're, they're pushing up into this point, like you said, around the regulatory side. Because I mean, you put really important information into these things and it's providing feedback to you that's also really important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're talking about patient health data, and it's actually one of the biggest concerns that patients have, as well as providers, is, is you know, it, are pe is people's data safe? Mm. And it really, like, it's hard for, in the current environment, for people to even know what to look for to assess that. Um, so I do actually, like, a lot of kind of helping people understand, like, like what to look for to, to, under to know that it is a digital therapeutic level intervention that therefore has the degree of robust kind of uh, like HIPAA, high trust and other yeah. security uh, measures to keep people's data safe. So that's like, you know, one one thing that differentiates. Uh, but you, to your point, it's like it's uh, I think that the patient experience is just as important in a digital, digital therapeutic as it is in a consumer wellness app. And I think it's it's that's like some that's work that's still happening today, I think, to try to ensure that just because something is delivering a clinical clinical grade intervention doesn't mean it needs to be sterile in terms of this look and feel. Yeah. So that's something we work on a lot at Big Health, like in our in our digital therapeutics is is providing a great patient experience that has, you know, is as smooth as using a consumer app, yeah. but is still delivering a clinical grade treatment. 
Do you find, so from a patient's point of view, you know, typically a patient might go to a doctor because the usual pathway has been, I need to go to the doctor to get a piece of paper to say I can have a medication because I wouldn't have otherwise been able to get this medication, have it prescribed to me. But if I'm, if the doctor just tells me to download an app that looks cool, I could have just downloaded an app. Now I'm fully aware of like, you know, the, the, that thing, but that cultural piece, I think is that there's, there's one aspect there in terms of the, the uh, efficacy and everything that, that we, we can talk about. And, and, and I've seen some great data in relation to that, but there's the adoption piece as well. And it's not just the trust side. It's the, well, the, if this looks so cool and it's sleek, is this, um, this is not what I'm used to. And, and that might buck some people. Does that, does that kind of resonate with you? Is that a challenge or is that just something that I'm probably overthinking about? I think that it's less of a challenge than it seems. And I guess I mean, from experience, so we were yeah. uh, in the UK with the NHS where we provide um, both sleep hour therapeutic for insomnia and day later therapeutic for generalized anxiety disorder through providers and both the providers and patients are incredibly satisfied to have non-drug options. Yeah. Where, pre- like, it turns out, people think that, I think there's a myth that patients want quick fixes, aka medications. Mm. Like, that's not what the research bears out. People don't want side effects. They know that they're not actually getting a cure, right? They have to continue to take the medication. There's a ton of, like, unfortunate downstream consequences, drug-drug interactions, like, you know, the consequences of some of the side effects, like weight gain or, like, rogginess which yeah. is serious and so i think that it's a, for digital therapeutics it's not like just rolling out another a new medication he, it is solving like a real gap and therefore we, i think we've actually found that patients are very happy to have their doctors refer they wouldn't have known which apps to pick right if they were to like they go to the app store and they you know it's hard it's so hard to differentiate so when you have a doctor say this is a legitimate treatment for sleep yep. it's what you need it's going to get you better i'll be here to support you if you need it but like you can you can do this on your own largely they're very happy yeah so i think it's like that's the integration that you really want to get good adoption you really yeah you I, want I love the, that yeah and you mentioned sleep there as an example what does a digital therapeutic look like for for assisting someone with some insomnia, insomnia or sleep issues so for insomnia and for most mental health disorders there are evidence-based behavioral and cognitive treatments that have been like well proven out to help address the root causes of those conditions and get people better. And so for insomnia, it's what's typically called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, super creative, CBT, <laughs> CBTI. <Yeah. laughs> and it's, and ultimately it's addressing a, a several different mechanisms of action um, or has seven different mechanisms of action that are addressing kind of the root cause of insomnia. And so those include things like circadian, uh, rhythm uh, difficulties or uh, uh, disruptions like, you know, which like that could be an example could be like if someone's jet lag, the disruption to their sleep was largely from shifting the circadian rhythm. Mm. But there's all kinds of other examples where that can get I shifted. I totally look forward to that in a few days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we can, sleep you can help you with that. Okay. It's not, uh, but it's also for, there's also more anxious um, and other like uh, physiological processes that can underlie insomnia. And so, the program essentially addresses the the set of different causes um, and maintaining factors of insomnia. And it's all through like cognitive and behavioral changes that, that we'd support you to make. It's personalized. Uh, so, you know, such you begin the program with an assessment of your sleep, which helps us know uh, what areas to focus on, uh, which helps us set like a personalized treatment program for you. And then going through it, like a core part of it is, of course, like tracking your sleep from night to night. And then based on that, we're able to guide through the specific be- behavioral changes and then do a lot of work around the anxious thinking patterns that are also generally happening for people who are having sleep problems. I think just by you explaining through some of those um, those elements of uh, the treatment that be received through the digital therapeutic, um, that's not stuff you get from a medication. It's it's things that you might get from a from a consultation, but I guess... In terms of the scale of the problems that are being solved, I imagine by doing it through a a smart firmification or a digital therapeutic, that's probably a lot more achievable to access a larger population than just trying to get more clinicians to do it. Am I right? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So there are something like a few hundred clinicians in the U.S. 
that are actually trained to like the highest level of standard around behavioral sleep behavioral medicine, which includes that treatment that I described to you. So we're talking, the issue is there's, there's many, many therapists uh, and ca who can provide great different types of general therapy. Most of them do not provide the specific treatment for insomnia. Mm. So if someone shows up in a therapist's office, which, I mean, I, I had this actually ex experience when I was a kid. Uh, I'm sure many, many people have. Insomnia is so common. And a therapist says, like, well, let's, let's talk about it. It's, like, incredibly frustrating because that's not the treatment for insomnia. And so it is, so ultimately, it's, it's not going to be best solved through increasing clinicians. It's, it's not really the kind of thing you want to spend a lot of time talking about. It's very specific behavioral adjustments. It's mm. like, well, based on your schedule, you should be going to sleep at this time. Here's what you're going to do when you wake up at night instead of what you did before. Mm. Um, here's how we're going to adjust your schedule over time to get your sleep more consolidated. Yes. And so it's again, it's not really, um, a, it's not a talking type of solution, though, you know, obviously great trained providers can do that in person with someone. But, you know, as a clinician myself, what I would rather do is uh, do the other things in live in a session that are more about the relationship and the emotional support, the motivation, and really let a patient use the specific digital tool to be providing like in the moment techniques and support mm. and you know and the, the structured scheduling etc like which is which just lends itself better to a digital format you're going to be up on a stage at some point today is that right tell us about what's going on there yeah we're gonna uh, it's called pillow talk we're gonna be talking about sleep uh and the importance of sleep to broader health and mental mm. health and uh we've got a great set of panelists uh from the research side as to several uh, different companies to providing different types of sleep services and intervention and I mean, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think it's it's a it's an interesting time in I think our cultural history where I feel like for the first time people are starting to understand the importance of sleep and prioritize it. Mm -hmm. It's you know at, at least in the U.S. and probably um, you know most of the developed parts of the world, we have tended to have a culture of like productivity is all that matters and like sleep when you die, mm -hmm. and not prioritizing it and. And it's with the with the knowledge we have now, it's very clear that that is poor thinking, and that you know creativity um, and advancement, uh, even just avoiding you know really fatal terrible mistakes um, in you know in certain types of uh, jobs where like sure. it is like it all depends on getting good sleep. We everyone sleeps, and most people sleep about a third of their lives, and so mm. spending more time prioritizing and focusing on it. Is, is incredibly crucial. And so I think that now's the time to do that. And we're trying to really like mobilize, um, you know, energy around that. There's a level of irony of having that message here in Las Vegas during a <laughs> conference. But, and I'm thinking that's probably one of the key takeaways I'm going to take from health is the, the importance of more sleep to be um, more switched on. However, from your perspective, what are some of the key takeaways that you might take from this event? Um, and also then... Uh, alternatively, people who might be watching your session or just attending the event generally think that like some of those key messages or takeaways you'd hope that people would, would take away and implement in their different health settings or, or um, uh, environments. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think number one is that uh, sleep and mental health are incredibly important. And there is not going to be just one solution that we're that we can have that's going to address the gaps that exist today. Yeah. And so I think today we're dealing with broad access gaps for any kind of mental health practitioners. And so there's companies that are trying to solve that, which is incredibly important. Um, but we're also dealing with significant gaps for people getting access to the specific treatments that they need. And instead, they're just getting medication, uh, which generally are second line, higher risk providers and patients do not do not want that to be the case. It's really just the only accessible option. So for me, the takeaway is for, you know, for anyone um, who's able to to really think about what's the full set of solutions that are going to be needed to provide patients both general support and therapy, mm -hmm. as well as the specific treatments for common conditions like insomnia, anxiety, and depression, uh, and, and, just, and just getting very clear about how to knit together, you know, a system that's actually going to get patients what they need. Hi, my name's Lisa Shaw. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Twin Health, and I am from Washington, D.C. Excellent. Thank you. And tell me a little bit more about Twin Health and what you guys do. Well, Twin Health is a chronic metabolic disease reversal company. We are very unique in that we use first of its kind digital twin technology to build a whole body digital twin of human metabolism. 
Using that whole body digital twin, we are able to help people reverse chronic metabolic disease, get off of medications. And we're talking about diseases like type 2 diabetes, obesity, prediabetes, hypertension, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Digital twin technology, that's a really cool space and emerging or at least a lot of interest around it. My layman's interpretation of it is basically like a sandbox version of a human that allows to kind of then determine what's going on or at least understand. So you're not actually mucking around with the real human. You've got the kind of comparable side one. Tell me a bit more about, help me understand a little bit more around the digital twin technology side. Yeah, close, but maybe a little different. Um, So what we're able to do is, I think about it, it's been used in a lot of industries. So airlines, Mm. uh, autonomous driving, right? So using sensor technology, we can study cause and effect. So imagine if you put wearable sensors on a human and you can collect thousands of data points a day about things they're doing and what's happening in their body, right? Mm -hmm. Just from these sensors, we can actually look through the digital twin at cause and effect. So see how a different food or a stress level or sleep uh, or your heart rate or you walk around a convention center, what does that do to the outputs that we're seeing, right? So blood glucose, hypertension, blood pressure, your heart rate, your respiratory rate. And using all of that, we're able to see how humans precisely react to certain things in their environment, certain things they do in their day-to-day lifestyle. Yes. And I guess in this current environment, we're increasing chronic disease and a lot of those the healthcare conditions we have often impacted by environment, right? So I guess if we could get a little bit in front of it, that must be a good thing. Yeah, it's a great thing. And if you think about it today, diseases like diabetes and obesity, we're treating them mostly with medications, right? Uh, So we go to the doctor, doctor says, eat better, sleep better, exercise more. Pretty generic, really hard to do, hard to sustain, right? Uh, And then they give you more meds. And every time you go to the doctor, maybe your hemoglobin A1C, if your diabetes gets a little better, yeah. you take the medication and then it gets a little worse, you get more medication. What yeah. we're really able to do is say, we know specifically what is uh, impacting your type two diabetes so that we can heal your metabolism internally. Yes. So what I mean by that is, as you're going through your day, we can tell our patients the top three things they need to do to help control their metabolism. For example, for some people, it's not just all carbs. White rice maybe mm. impacts them more than bread. Wouldn't it be nice to know? For some people, walking in the morning is more impactful than walking in the evening. For some people, they could eat the same exact meal for lunch three days in a, in a row, but if they got less than five and a half hours of sleep the night before, their blood sugar is 20 points higher the next yeah. day. You know, in healthcare, we're very good at treating an issue once it's happened, and it's a little bit harder to quantify the value that's being delivered by preventing something from happening in the first place, because then if it didn't happen, it's like, well, why did we do it? Like, we got nothing to demonstrate that it happened. But then it's like, that's the whole point of doing it in the first place is preventing something happening. So I guess having some of these measures and being able to add some science and quantification around it's then helpful, not just from a convincing clinicians to be able to, you know, see the value in using it, but also, I guess, from a funding and getting it, you know, the, the structure within the, the ecosystem as well to, to buy into hopefully gearing healthcare a little bit more towards the prevention side as opposed to just treating disease when it happens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, think about all the things you can prevent progression of disease. You can prevent new diseases from coming that are all related to things like insulin resistance or fat deposition in your body. So if you can solve all those problems for people, there's loads of things that you're actually preventing in the future for happening to them. Our entire model is that if we can get you off of medicine, return your body to normal clinical values and reverse that chronic disease in the first place, it doesn't mean you're not at risk for it again, but but being able to take that away has, has significant impact. I'd say the other thing that's really nice about and AI in general, artificial intelligence in general, and these wearable sensors is it's really giving people the power of the data, right? The knowledge, patients, being able to know exactly what's happening to their blood sugar, what's happening to their blood pressure, their weight, uh, what what are the different things in their lives that are impacting it so they can have accountability and responsibility for the changes they make as well. And we spoke a bit about then just about the objective outcomes from from a patient's point of view, but I imagine too there are financial outcomes that are favorable by doing this kind of stuff too. Is some of that measurable that you can speak about as well? Yes, because we've been able to reverse type 2 diabetes, meaning we've been able to take uh, A1C down to normal clinical values and remove medications, expensive costly medications in 72% of our population. We've been able to eliminate 71% of high cost diabetes meds. And that's really important because these medications can cost upwards of $12,000 a year, some yeah. of them higher. And by pulling that cost out of the system, we're able to save uh, employers and uh, health plans a significant amount of money annually for these patients. Mariam, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How good. 
Good. Long time no speak. I feel like we could just chat, and because uh, <laughs> it's it's been a while, and we know yeah. each other well. But and we've caught up at health, so it's it's great to yeah. see you today. I'm so glad to be here, and also to see you. Yes, excellent. For those that don't know, could you please introduce yourself and tell us who you are and where you're from? Sure. Uh, my name is Maya. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Medoptima. Uh, Medoptima is in the business of saving lives. Uh, we are a digital health company focused on dermatology from Vancouver, Canada. We have our business and operations in Australia and also in the US. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are providing AI-powered smart platform for dermatology, um, helping um, everyone in the patient journey, including patients themselves, um, uh, primary care providers and specialists for better care coordination, better quality diagnostics and saving lives and saving costs. Excellent. Thank you. That sounds very familiar to me. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> Such a surprise. <laughs> no, you know what is interesting? As you said that, uh, two things I noted that um, speaking very much about dermatology in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I, I recall from back in 2018, 2019, you were back on the podcast in the early, early days. We spoke about the role of artificial intelligence in this space and yep. being that intelligent assistant. Yeah. Uh, and, and AI has always been of interest, but in the last six, 12 months, uh, it's probably explosive less than now. that. It's, it's exploded. Yeah. So in, in that in that situation, what's that been like for the organization? How's that Has that changed anything or reaffirmed some positions with the organization? What's, what's the, 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 um, the, the vibe now? You know, from the beginning, I think our DNA was like, um, you know, AI and as two co-founders, computer scientists training in a specialty dermatology and um, basically computing science and machine learning. Uh, when we started, it wasn't that uh, hot, I would say. And as one of the companies leading this, I believe, in, uh, in our domain at least, um, bringing AI to real life clinical applications, um, it was tough because like you won't believe like the challenges we had when we started. It was like, oh, can I host my data on the cloud? It's like, is it safe? And that's like today is like everywhere. Like mm. we are not questioning if my sh patient data should be on the cloud or not, right? Like, imagine the challenges you have building an AI-based company when there is no even digitization. So, mm -hmm. but um, those days are past now. I think now we, what we see um, in terms of the market and um, I used to talk about the power of AI technology, you know, potential for AI to contribute to better care and all of that. And honestly, recently I've been talking about the challenges and uh, overestimating AI and how you implement it for clinical success and uh, how you minimize the risk and how you even analyze your risk. Mm. There are not really, not really many best practices developed. Like there are no guidelines to say how this should be implemented. Like AI for me and for you and for the other doctor will be totally different based on our settings, our patients, our specialty. Mm. There's like so many biases we need to address in that setting and all of that. But it's just really, um, challenging and also super, super exciting when you're leading these type of implementations, right? There's a yeah. lot we're learning every day. Um, I can tell you, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we have the biggest database of um, quality labeled images in dermatology of uh, close to 11 million. Wow. Right? Um, over 3 million patient profiles on our platform, serving over 5,000 medical professionals in more than 26, 2700 medical locations today. Mm. So we have this global knowledge about this practice, um, practice of implementing AI for clinical success, not just engineering success, right? Uh, when it comes to evaluating AI, um, most cases, it's a nice big number on the table, like in, uh, in the table in your publications. Yes. If you have evaluation, if you have um, clinical studies, all of that, but that's not real life. Real life is like, okay, what is this doing today in the hands of doctors and how do you know this is working for them? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm really excited to see how we are contributing to this implementation science. Yes. Right. It's, it's one of those basic sciences, really. We saw this as like application and then it's like, no, there's no application. It's still science. Like you mm. need to develop the basics of the science and say what's important, how you implement it, what you measure, how you analyze the risk, how you mitigate the risk and all of that. So yeah. anyway, for us today, um, it's really exciting to see that we are at some of the top centers of excellence globally, um, working with these pioneers 
in this field, like saying, like today I had a really good chat with one of the top university hospitals coming to us and saying that we need this for our community. You know how many patients we have, the wait time we have for plastic surgery and for melanoma and for uh, other types of skin cancer. So why we don't have it already? It's mm. like, uh, like, yeah, I know, but yeah. this is also important how you implement it, uh, how you don't jump ahead of yourself. It's really, really easy when it comes to marketing AI to just say things that looks hot and exciting, yeah. right? But really, when it comes to implementation, you need to take all those steps to make sure it's the best practice. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. You mentioned a few times that the fact there's a global approach to things as well. And I imagine this space where, you know, to, to you know, here in Australia, images of skin cancer, that's great, but we've got a pretty standard demographic yeah. of people that, yeah. that are here, that's not going to be helpful for yeah. the other side of the world. Absolutely. So getting that kind of scale is that, um, you know, people might think, well, there's the big tech companies that have access to just, you know, mountains and mountains of data for, from being, you know, the startup through to the scale up that MetaOptima is. H how do you go about building out such a, a robust kind of data set of uh, images or, or information to be able to reliably provide this information at a global scale? That's a really good point. I think for, um, I say, fair access to technology, in this case, fair access to AI, we need to um, provide access to all patients mm. around the globe, right? So we initiated projects to um, even donate our platform to the centers in Africa. Um, we want to make sure we have diversity, we have inclusion in the core of our company culture and building around that. So if you don't digitize um, data for these type of patients, then they won't have access to technology because there was no data to train the system to serve them. So that's one of the things really, really important. Uh, in our case, uh, we have created this community project. Um, actually, I learned one of our employees told me it was the best project she worked in her life. There you go. Uh, yeah. So just offering the solution to cancer centers, dermatology groups, and um, I mean, whoever is serving these patients, mm. um, skin of color specifically is a focus for us. Um, just because like when you look at the um, normal distribution of technology, yes, those patients who need it the most have the least access, right? So mm. we need to change that, which is a big thing. You know, as a small company, you don't have all the things you need to be successful, but at least we are trying our best. But I think it's really important to say, I have analyzed risk and I have taken steps. I have been taking steps to make sure I'm addressing that risk and I'm moving forward, making progress. Mm. In our case, we don't claim we have a skin cancer diagnostic AI for skin type five, six, yeah. right? This is really important to say, I cannot do this just because I don't have data, but I have taken the step, mm. I'm bringing data and I'm addressing that. So I have done my part to provide yes. fair access to care for all patients. So um, that's one of the things, uh, in terms of your question, when it comes to big companies versus smaller companies, um, I think, <laughs> In, a, in our case, we win by focusing on what we are really, really good at, and we only do that. Yes. We are in the medical practice. We have taken everything we could to make sure we are compliant, right? We do best, and we are really good at what we do. So there are partnership opportunities. It's not like all big companies make and build everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. They find good companies. They want to be... Um, basically part of that future. Um, this, I mean, like smaller companies want to be yeah. part of that bigger future. So they're also open for partnerships. In our case, um, we've been talking to many of these big players. Yeah. And I think um, we are part of the future. We are building yeah. it. Uh, I don't Amazing. say like we have um, really like figured out everything, but I know we are good at knowing what we know and what we don't know. And to your point as well, I, what, what I do like is that the, the solid foundation in that medical rigor and the, and the research side of things and, and the trust in the data, you know, when in doubt, you know, building these really robust kind of foundations, because uh, if you're trying to build trust and credibility within the healthcare ecosystem, yeah. doing things that really impact people's lives, you've got to build from that foundation with that yeah. peer reviewed journals and things exactly. like that. Exactly. So yeah. Um, it's really important. And it's really difficult to gain trust as first movers, right? Yes. But we've done it. And I think in our case, um, our partners, our clients know 
that they are in good hands in terms of privacy, in terms of patient rights, in terms of term abuse, in terms of so many other aspects of building your good culture, good business. Um, so, yeah, I think that's also really important. And lastly, what, what's exciting about the future then, Mariam? What's, what can we look forward to seeing from Meta Optima in the next 6 to 24? Actually, several things happening. I'm really excited about our um, new um, engine, their engine AI engine. So it's not just app or just mm. one algorithm. We have over 30 algorithms on our current platform. Yeah. You know that, but actually we are building this like um, engine that our enterprise partners and clients can program Mm. right to use AI it means it's not one app that actually you will have and your colleague and everyone will have yeah, cool. it's it's going to be the engine that you say what's your input data it can be totally different than my data and we have the engine that you can say what should be your output data so for example you can say I want to separate um, high risk patients for um, dermatitis or psoriasis general dermatitis just skin cancer and even in skin cancer you can say I want my basal cell carcinoma, non-melanoma skin cancers to go through this pathway for care coordination. Mm. Yeah. I want my melanoma patients to be referred to their dermato-oncology unit or whatever is that risk that you are taking in your care coordination, it's your choice. It's not one threshold that says, oh, it's cancer, it's not yes. cancer. This is saying that I'm going to use it as my backhand engine for my care coordination, for my resource assessment, um, uh, management assignment, and also for minimizing risk. Like you can identify today how many live melanomas you have in your patients in the system, how many you've missed, how many you've underdiagnosed, and that's actually, I think, really powerful. So yeah, that's a new engine we've built. It's now in um, three countries Wow, under pilot. So major health systems trying that and um, the other thing is that we are introduce, introducing our um, virtual reality powered dermatology, which That's is going to be very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, I know it's new to you too. <laughs> yes. So basically, it's all about revolutionizing dermatology. You know how labor intensive it is, right? Sure. Like with, when it comes to exams, documenting. And I spend maybe 25 to 45 minutes for my patient, and I'm only, if ever taking a few photos yeah. and maybe just lighting a couple of sentences in my patient, you know, patient records and I hate my EMR and, you know, I love the feedback <laughs> the we things, have from yeah. our doctors yeah. um, because it's just time consuming. But mm. the, the idea was how we transition this and how we have um, an efficient model that's actually um, documenting the whole exam, um, creating a different experience. Our doctors remotely could Mm. Navigate the patient exam, do it whatever they want, right? And that's actually, and now it's powered by AI. It can summarize um, the full exam and also it has our visual, um, <laughs> yeah, they're mentioned AI. Wow, so <laughs> there you go. That's really, really cool. And you know, our damn drone project, right? Yeah, so it's actually, uh, it was started oh. from that. So we had built that, that model. We, we are working on the patient, you know, indoor navigation and yeah. safety and all of those. But actually, when we had this new addition, it's using our 3D body modeling algorithms. It's using our uh, oh, basic patient exam and navigation algorithms. So anyway, it's going to be really, really um, innovative in terms of the advancements in dermatology. And it's not just dermatology. I think it has many more other applications, but our focus is on dermatology. So, Peter, great to be with you. I'm Aaron Ganny, the founder and CEO of Behavior uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. Amazing. And tell me a little bit more about Behavior. And there's like a viewer at the end of it, right? Yeah, we go with Behavior or Behavior. Yes. So what we You'll do, answer to both. <laughs> that's right, we answer to both. We have a pipeline of digital therapeutics, all focused on mental and behavioral health. So a range from chronic pain to anxiety, depression, opioid use disorder, and even agoraphobic avoidance in serious mental illness patients. Mm -hmm. We use the medium of virtual reality because it is very neurologically powerful and differentiated and superior, candidly, when you use it for certain things, particularly when you're addressing things related to fear and pain. So for fear, think exposure therapy, putting you yep. in the presence of the thing that is a threat for you, whether that's you're socially anxious or you're afraid to go out of your house, like agoraphobic avoidance, a much more severe form or OCD or panic disorder or something like that triggers you and is, you know, fires that sort of emotional and physiological response that puts you into fight or flight mode, we can use the ability 
of this multi-sensory simulation in VR to trip your animal brain, sort of your primitive brain, your limbic system into believing basically this is my new reality. That is really useful for working through your ability to cope with and challenge your own assumptions about that. So that's half, exposure therapy. The flip side of that is we can put you in amazing, calming, soothing environments and quickly get you into a calm state, specifically like parasympathetic nervous system dominance. Mm. That's the fear side of the equation. On the pain side, lots and lots of evidence over more than a decade of the power of the medium to relieve acute pain in the moment. So think, really distract you from pain. And we use it for chronic pain through pain neuroscience education, calming and mindfulness, and then critically, graded exercise and gamified movement. So that's why we work in the medium of VR on that specific set of conditions. Yeah. Got you, nice one. And I like the bringing together of speaking about digital therapeutics through the medium of VR, because I, I naively, for some reason, I, or, or just from repetition perhaps, I think of digital therapeutics, I think of a smartphone app, but yeah. there's, there's obviously many mediums that those digital therapeutics can deliver. And I guess that's reassuring and necessary from, from a clinical point of view to give the rigor around digital therapeutics for the, for the modality of virtual reality, to give that credibility because we're dealing with clinical interventions, right? Yeah, I mean, there's you can be forgiven for sort of assuming when you hear digital therapeutics, you think, oh, it's probably an app on a smartphone. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. They're ubiquitous. Most people have them. Uh, we work in VR because of the reasons I stated. But I think even more interesting is it's really not about one medium. Like people will sometimes say to me, oh, you have a VR company. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, no. Yeah. I'd be like if I said I had a smartphone app company. Like, what yeah. does that mean? Nothing, right? Yeah. So we're a digital therapeutics company. We work in VR. We do some things on a smartphone. We do some things with wearables, with okay. sensors. So the objective here is to use the digital tools and capabilities of today, mm. the latest being, hey, what can we do with generative AI? Let's use all these digital modalities and tools in a way that is evidence-based, clinically proven to be safe and effective. And that digital solution, whatever combination of tools and modalities is, it has some properties humans don't. Yeah. They scale exponentially really without limits and marginal costs just go down, down, down. So we can start to close the gaps in care that we have and change the, you know, the accessibility, the scalability, and the economics of care. Yeah, you touched on that. Um, it's not just the digital modality based on efficacy, but I, I feel like more importantly, the, the choice of tool necessary that's used often then is determined based on how accessible it is. Like not everyone's got an Oculus Quest in the top drawer at home, you know, so yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's part of the point that's as right. well. Yeah. That's right. And in terms of then, um, you know, in this digital therapeutic space where digital therapeutics not being a new kind of area that we're playing in, I guess, somewhat new in the, in the grander scheme of things. But I guess we've seen a few seasons of digital therapeutics and organizations coming through and, and having success with different business models and, and not success in, in, in different business models. Where are we now in this whole kind of journey of digital therapeutics, I guess, and how it fits in with the broader kind of health system? Yeah, it is definitely a journey, right? There's, there's a lot of complexity. It's a new category of, of medicine, if you will. Yeah. And so there's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid. We needed regulatory frameworks to define, well, what does safe and effective look like? Like, what do national health technology assessors need to see to decide, yeah, that thing really is safe and really is effective and really is better than placebos or yeah. other, other standards of care? So that's one dimension. There's a whole dimension around health economics. Okay, it works, but is it cost effective? Mm. Is there an ROI? Uh, there's a lot of work to be done around usability factors and engagement. So there's... Um, it's really a whole field that has taken quite a while of to, to sort of you know build these learning layers and learn from each other. And that's what the companies in this space, what we all do. At one level, you could think of us as competitors. Almost all the time, we treat each other like sort of fellow travelers, you know? Yeah. We, we need to, to continue to grow this field, make it more and more relevant. It is, you know, the world needs what we're building. That's the only way we're gonna close these gaps. Mm. So the latest, let's say uh, important focus in the space is around business model. Uh, you know, the, anyone tracking the space, even casually, probably heard about the setbacks of, you know, hair therapeutics and their bankruptcy. And it's sort of ironic, right? Because they're at one of the absolute leaders and pioneers. They showed a lot of us many parts of how to do this well. Mm. Working with the FDA, forging these pathways. So I think we're all appreciative of that. And there are a lot of smart people that built that company. It didn't work out for a set of reasons, but the broader, so what, was it caused everybody in the field to say, you know, we gotta take a step back and be really thoughtful about business model. There's not gonna be one magic business model. 
and it's causing folks to look at it more uh, in more subtle ways. Like, what's the disease state I'm going after, and what are the what are what's the prevalence? Uh, what are the typical economics of that disease state for the sponsors or payers? Who's likely to benefit when I make that patient healthier? Sometimes it's really only them and their family. Other times it might be their insurance company or you know uh, some other entity, and so. Uh, and then there's questions about modality in those devices, right? For some products, there literally is a physical component. So mm. sensors and um, uh, you know other other hardware components married with software. For other products, it's pure software running on off-the-shelf hardware. So the so what of all of that is there's not one model. People are looking now and and taking action successfully in going over the counter, direct to consumer. Some are doing a durable medical equipment software in a medical device approach, which works for some products. Others are saying, no, we're software as medical device, but we treat conditions which are high prevalence and high cost. And so if we put that inside something where we can drive outcomes and savings for payers, employers, value-based care providers, it sort of washes away a lot of the business model complexity and you have payers going, well, I want that outcome and I want those savings. So yeah, yeah I want that thing you're selling. Yeah, absolutely. So those, those measurables that, that um, are very important in this space around outcomes and savings. So in terms of the, the patient outcomes and the economic impact on or the, the, the financial impact on, on the system, are there any specifics that you can talk uh, in relation to behavior that have come about from utilizing the platform? Yeah, so I've, I'll give you an example of one of our products is Game Change, which is um, a product we actually acquired when we acquired Oxford VR last year. Oxford VR is a spin out of Oxford University, the work of Dr. Daniel Freeman and his team. And Daniel still works with us. His, his main day job is he is the head of psychology, experimental psychology at Oxford University. So in the UK, with a national health system, part of their evaluation framework is by definition, like does this thing work, is it safe and effective? Mm. And what are the health economic implications for the national health system yeah. and societal costs? And they have uh, pretty clear ways to evaluate that. And so with Game Change, we went through the big clinical trials to show safety and efficacy. We did health economics studies. Uh, and, and now we're at the stage where working with NICE in the UK, we are um, positioned to do larger scale rollouts with evidence generation to show that this stuff really works in the real world, really drives savings in the national health system, mm. and even drives savings in societal costs, things like caregiver costs and things that wouldn't normally be considered part of healthcare. So that's an example of, you know, depending on the structure and the economics of your national health system, because not every country is the US, it also changes how you evaluate the value of these therapeutic solutions. Yeah. Amazing. Lastly, look, we're, we're on the final day of health here in Las Vegas and with the, I've seen a lot of sessions on a lot of different stages and spoken to a lot of uh, people around and about. Any kind of biggest key takeaways that you might, might walk away from this event or perhaps would hope that others would then go back and implement in their own health systems? Yeah, well, health is such a great event. It's so high energy and lots and lots of rapid connections and business mm. development. Lots of innovation happening. Obviously, a lot about AI, about you know, various forms of digital health. I think for me, the theme is, you know, the most successful companies, the, one that, the ones that rapidly rise to prominence and get real traction, they use all sorts of innovations and technologies, but they really define their mission as, we have this patient population with a set of conditions or challenges or problems, whether it's age or acuity or geography or, you know, mental or behavioral conditions or whatever it is. We solve that problem for those humans who need that kind of help. And when you see companies like that, they tend to do really well. Now it takes all sorts of sort of in innovations around enablement, around digital therapeutics, around AI, around how to make those things work. They are rife with technology, mm. but they're really about driving improvement in lives in that condition and associated savings. And that's probably the lesson for all of us. As long as you keep your eye on that, it makes it a lot clearer how to move forward. Mm. My name is Mike Montello, and I'm Senior Vice President of R&D Digital and Tech at GSK. Uh, what that means and the big problems that my, myself and my team are focused on is uh, target choice, uh, which, which is the starting point of making medicines and vaccines and discovering medicines and vaccines uh, through predicting uh, the design of molecules uh, before we start testing them in human. So that's a big problem to, to try to get the, the translation models built and correct uh, to 
speeding up uh, clinical studies uh, so we can get medicines and vaccines to the market faster uh, and optimize the cost to uh, chemistry, manufacturing, control, which is the process engineering for how we make molecules at scale. So there, yes. that's what my team does, and we essentially apply digital and technology approaches uh, to optimize those areas of, of research and development. Yeah. Excellent. It's great to see a good representation from GSK here at Health as well. And being a pharmaceutical company, it's interesting that there's such interest in, in the digital and health tech space. Tell me a little bit more about you know how you're thinking about that. Yeah, so this is my uh, second time at Health. Yeah. Uh, so I was here last year and had an opportunity uh, to see the conference and see uh, who's here and what the conversation is and uh, what people are talking about and who the innovators are. And this year uh, we have a broader uh, team at GSK. So we have leaders within research and development. We have leaders within Vive, uh, which is our dedicated business mm -hmm. to HIV. And we're here engaging, we're here connecting. Uh, we're here uh, finding startups and other innovators uh, that want to work with us to solve some of the problems that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we're at a time uh, where technology is, is, is very much exponential. We hear that term all the time. Sure. Um, but how do we uh, sort through uh, some of the hype and some of the noise and get to clarity of the problems that we're solving and introduce the best tools uh, to actually solve those problems. And we believe that some of the answers, of course, sit in digital health and sit within health tech. Yeah. Uh, so what we're doing is uh, finding uh, the innovators that are here um, and linking what's happening in healthcare, so at point of care with patients and linking that into the research that we're doing. So we have a more of a closed loop cycle uh, between research and uh, the medicines and vaccines that are being developed. That's such an important area in terms of pulling those different parts of the broader health ecosystem, I guess, together in terms of from lab to the bedside, all that kind of stuff that, that we speak about. But there's the, the, the role that technology plays in, in doing that is, is really interesting. I'd love for you to you know maybe unpack like what, what that might look like specifically, but also the role that that, that collabor collaboration piece plays as well. I think that, you know, research is very much considered there, I'm doing this to write a paper and then, and then but not thinking around the, the commercial aspects and the outcomes of that, or it might be, you know, all, all these points around drug discovery, which is very much, you know, your area. And then on the other side, the startups and the commercial side, which might be back through venture and has no optics of the, all the other kind of pieces. So it's really nice to hear that you're thinking about that whole kind of picture and how that plays. Yeah, I can talk, a, talk a little bit about how kind of technology fits into that and helps enable yeah. it, uh, cause, because the it takes it'll take the ecosystem to solve uh, some of the l larger problems to make uh, medicine and vaccines more precise, to have more impact uh, to patients that uh, perhaps are not responding to the the therapies that are on the market today. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways that we're using technology, uh, you know, we talk about uh, using AI and drug discovery a lot, um, but what's input to um, developing the algorithm? It's data. Uh, so we're investing in data technology and data infrastructure uh, that can aggregate and bring data together for our AI machine learning engineers uh, that are working on uh, finding better targets, uh, which are novel biology, so the root cause of disease, and also finding uh, patients that would respond most uh, to uh, therapies and, and vaccines. And uh, behind that sits data, and I'll just maybe break it down in a little bit more detail. So this year we announced the Onyx Research Data Platform. Uh, and that's a very intentional team that helps, helps us scale AI and drug discovery. Our ambition is to recruit 100 people this year, or, or over 50 people uh, part of that team. Uh, we're setting up uh, tech partnerships uh, with our group. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale of the data, um, GSK in one year generated 21 billion data points. So that data needs to be ingested, it needs to be linked. It feels high to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me give you one more uh, metric that's a little bit higher. So. We also work on building uh, a knowledge graph of, of all the uh, biomedical data that, that we generate and also have access to through collaborations because we don't, we're not in this alone. So in research, yeah. we have many collaborations uh, that help us investigate areas of science. And one of our knowledge graphs is 300 billion oh, okay. biomedical <laughs> data points. Um, now sitting underneath uh, these graphs, these massive databases, uh, sits lots of engineering. So yeah. platform engineering, uh, data technology, computational ways of doing data governance, uh, and also ways to scale AI. So if you have yeah. 100 plus machine learning engineers, 
developing models, uh, solving these problems across uh, many different types of diseases, we need a scaled approach to do that, right? So that's Onyx, yeah. uh, and that's uh, a big technology that we're investing in. Yeah, no, it's, I, I was gonna say, you know, it, if you've got 300 billion data points plus some change, you're probably not gonna be able to really make a good dent in that with 100 and something people. So artificial intelligence is gonna play a very important role in that. I'd love to know, particularly in the past 12 months or so with all the excitement around generative AI and how that might play a part. I'd love to understand how you're thinking about how that might play a role in all of this. Sure. Yeah, it's generative AI. Uh, one is, you know, it's still relatively new, although, you know, earlier this year is when OpenAI uh, and you know, others released large language models uh, that were more you know ac accessible. I think yeah. now, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, AI is now accessible to everyone, yeah. and that was a huge inflection point this year. Uh, and we've been using large language models approaches and transformer models. Uh, it's it wasn't just this year, right? So our our teams have been using uh, similar type um, algorithms and and architectural patterns. Uh, to build algorithms uh, over the past couple of years in drug discovery. Uh, but what's new is these foundational models that enable you to create content. And in the R&D process, uh, there's a lot of content being created. Mm -hmm. uh, and these um, manifest in terms of submissions and documentation uh, that's submitted to health authorities. So I really see the opportunity for Generative AI to you know, take some of the mundane activities uh, that exist in R&D uh, and, you know, take that off the shoulders of our scientists and our researchers uh, so they can focus more on science. Uh, and I really look forward to that. And you know, we do have uh, several experiments that are running uh, that are building um, applications on top of generative AI uh, foundational models uh, to help automate some of those uh, mundane activities. So um, that's an example, but also, um, I mean, there's so much literature being created uh, within science. I talked about uh, the knowledge graph. Uh, so large language model uh, approaches can also extract entities from publications, they can read and write to the graph. Uh, so it's a technology that can also help us sort through uh, and summarize uh, all the data that's being generated within yeah. science. Throughout this conversation, I've you know heard a strong kind of call for the, the collaboration piece, whether it be, you know, building the, the team out for, for Onyx or encouraging those partnerships with those those tech providers. Sometimes from, from those perspectives, it might be, um, you know, uh, challenging to understand whether, you know, there's an opportunity to do something with GSK or any large organization if you're on the other side. What, what types of organi uh, what groups or people I would, would you really be keen to um, collaborate with and speak with and, and how should they get in touch? Yeah, so uh, the, I mean, the first is understanding our priorities. Yeah. And the, the first part to start is uh, one of the, the focus areas that we're researching in. Uh, so HIV, infectious disease, vaccines, uh, respiratory, immunology, oncology. Uh, these are our focus uh, therapeutic areas. So if there's uh, digital health uh, companies that uh, are working in these spaces uh, that are engaging with patients and differently, or you know, generating uh, some data that may be useful to help us, you know, plan protocols mm -hmm. uh, for our clinical studies, or you know, finding you know one of the big problems that 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 we have within development is uh, recruiting patients and enrolling patients. So if we can uh, use some insights uh, with real world data uh, to find you know maybe the different um, cities that potentially have patient populations to help us with recruitment. Uh, so that's an example of, of where we can use uh, digital health uh, capabilities to, mm. to help us solve some of the problems in development. And yeah, I don't, I don't think um, whether you're small or large, I want to hear from both. And you know, we do work with uh, Microsoft, we work with Google, so we work with really large yeah. tech companies, um, but we also work with smaller ones. Mm. Uh, and the smaller ones are creative, uh, they're innovative. Uh, they also um, challenge some of our thinking so we can think about the problem a bit differently. Uh, so the way we partner is very collaborative. Uh, and then the conversation is very important uh, that we have together because we can get to clarity of the problem and link the problem to the solution and sometimes co-develop the solution because it something doesn't exist. But we have very talented people both within uh, GSK plus at the the you know the company that we're working with. Um, but together we can do we can get things uh, farther faster. So I think uh, that's the opportunities. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Health Tech. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this episode with someone who might find it valuable. For more information and resources about healthcare innovation, visit TalkingHealthTech.com.